Today we have come to week five in our transformation series. 50 days of transformation. The goal is that at the end of 50 days, there would be some changes in our lives. The problem with change, though, is that change is hard. Now, we are of the opinion that the other person ought to change and change forthwith. You need to change. And, and why haven't you changed? Why aren't you different? But with us, we give grace. I'm working on it. Eventually, I'll get there. It's a slow process for me. But for you, you need to change yesterday. But if you've ever tried to change, you know that change is hard. The obvious things that we talk about, losing weight, changing the way you eat, what you eat, that's hard. Those taste buds don't take readily to kale. I mean, you, you may do it for a couple of weeks, but eventually that cheesecake comes calling. And before we know it, we're back to where we were, or we really never changed. And so I'm under no illusions that at the end of these 50 days that our church is going to be filled with perfect saints, with all of their problems and issues behind them, and we're just floating around on clouds. That, that's not going to happen. But what we are attempting to do is to set the foundation with the ingredients that we need in order to change, and not all of us need the same amount of change in the same areas. There are some things that are real strongholds for me that may not be for you. There are things for you that may not be for me. One of those areas that we struggle with is relationships. We struggle with relationships over everything that we deal with in life. There's so much Issues in relationships. A husband and wife been married for 50 years. And they're congratulated on 50 years of marital bliss. And one of them says, yeah, we've been married 50 years. I just praise God for the good too. <laughs> relationships are hard. And when you get people together in a relationship, they, they, they chafe on each other and they bring all of their idiosyncrasies and all of their issues and problems to the table. And, and when you engage in a relationship, whether it be a marital relationship, a friendship, an acquaintance, a job relationship, we bring baggage to the relationships. But we want to give some help today on how we can face the fears that ruin relationships. You go back to the book of Genesis and look at that relationship between Adam, his wife, and ultimately their relationship with God. I want to read this. This is uh, uh, not in any of your, ver probably not in your usual version, but I want to read. Chapter 3, 6 through 19 in your hearing. So Eve ate some of the fruit. Then she also gave some to her husband, Adam, who was with her, and he ate it. Immediately their eyes were opened, and they suddenly felt shame at their nakedness. So they sewed fig leaves together to cover up themselves, then they heard the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and they hid from God among the trees. But God called out to Adam, where are you? Adam replied, I heard you coming, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. 
Then God asked, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? And Adam said, you gave me this woman. And she gave me the fruit. So I ate it. Then God said to Adam, why did you do this? Eve replied, the, said, God said to Eve, why did you do this? Eve replied, the serpent deceived me and I ate it. So God said to Eve, because you disobeyed me, you will have greater trouble in pregnancy and give great pain in childbirth. And though you'll desire your husband, he's going to lord it over you. Now, there, there's, there's some conflict right there. Then God said to Adam, because you also disobeyed me and sinned with your wife, the ground you work is now cursed. And though you will get to eat what you have planted, your fields will have weeds and thorns and thistles. And for the rest of your life, you will have to sweat and work hard to get your food until you yourself are returned to the dirt I used to create you. And there we have the story of the fall in the garden. But what we also see in here are some dynamics of a relationship that was problematic. And so I want to break our message today in, into two things. First of all, I, I want to talk about the fears that ruin relationships. And then I want to talk about how do we get out of that. There's three basic fears that, that, that ruin our relationships. When we get into relationships, how come our relationships don't get as deep and intimate as they could be? And, and don't tell me we've been together a long time because we can be together a long time and still not know each other. The first fear of a relationship or that ruins is my fear of exposure. The fear of exposure makes me distant. And what, what is it? The truth here is that there's a lot of you that you don't like. I'm going to say that again. There's a lot in you that you don't like. That you don't accept. And, and, and if you don't accept it, you don't want others to accept it either. I don't want to put myself out there. You, there's things about me that I don't like. There's things about me that I don't feel good about. And if I don't feel good about it, then I'm not going to put it out for someone else to judge for someone else to have an opinion about, for someone else to reject me. Verse 9 and 10 says, God called Adam, and he asked him, Why are you hiding? And Adam said, I was afraid because I was naked. The first thing we notice is that he says, I was afraid. Why are you hiding? Well, I'm hiding because I'm afraid. It's interesting that God asked him the question when God already knew the answer, but God, God really wanted him to admit to what was going on. God says, why are you hiding? So now Adam has to come clean and tell God why he's hiding. He says, I was afraid and I hid. Fear causes us to hide. And there are parts of our lives that we hide from each other. In church, we hide from each other. What are you hiding from today? What is it about you that, 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 that if it were revealed, it would just, whoo, you, you just couldn't take it. And so you hide that part of your life. God wants us to face what it is that we fear. And then he says, I hid because I was naked. Now, the nakedness was both a physical nakedness, but it was also a metaphor for life. Because to be naked is to be exposed. To be naked is to be uncovered. It is to be vulnerable. It is to be out in the open. It is to be unprotected. And guess what? It is scary. And church is a wonderful place, but it's also a place that gives us comfort in hiding. Because as Christians, we can hide behind passages of Scripture. We can hide behind religious phrases. We can protect ourselves. When someone wants to get close, we can come up with a, with a phrase that will just put you at bay. 
Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. If, if, if I can demonstrate to my, to my church family that I've got the right lingo, then they won't pry. They won't probe. They won't try to get all up in my business because I, I, I put them off by my words. I get scared when I have a Christian that's always quote, quoting Scripture to me. Now, I, now you say, Pastor, why would you say that? No, when, when I got, a, when I got a, pre a, 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 a Christian that's more Christian than Jesus, I get scared. How you doing, brother? They got a scripture. Where you been yesterday? They got another scripture. I'm like, whoa, 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 slow down. Why? Because sometimes in order to keep people at bay, we refuse to be open and transparent, and we cover it up. Make ourselves seem more holy than we are. One of our deepest fears is the fear of being seen for what we really are. Sometimes that's a fearful, insecure, sometimes it's an angry individual, but we hide. And there are three things to this. Number one, the damage happens in three stages. Number one, we see in the text, verse 7, that, that, that there's shame. Why do we hide? We hide because of shame. They suddenly felt shame at their nakedness. Fear is often based in shame because I don't want to be what? Exposed. For when you carry shame, you're easily embarrassed. Shame makes you more self-conscious. It makes you nervous. It makes you fearful of humiliation. Who wants to be exposed publicly? Shame is a motivator. And I think, that there's, I think there's good in shame because if we didn't have shame, we'd do a whole lot more crazy stuff. But shame also can trap us into a closed position where we're unable to be open. But this leads to the cover-up. When, when I feel ashamed, then I cover up. So they sowed fig leaves to cover up themselves. And I build layer upon layer and layer upon layer of cover to hide myself from other people seeing who I am. Today we have a lot of ways to cover up our shame. We may not sow fig leaves, and, 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 but we have other ways. You know, think of it. Some of us cover our fear with humor. We're the funniest one in the room, but we've got some fears. Ask the family of Robin Williams, one of the funniest men on the planet. But when it all came down to it, he lived a tortured life inside of his, himself. Now, a lot of it, you know, I'm not getting into the whole psychological, but, but he was the funny man. You'd never think the funny man had issues. There are those that present an image of being put together. You know the kind. There's not a hair out of place, immaculately dressed, diction is on point. They walk with their shoulders back and their head up. I mean, they got it together. When you shake their hand, it's like you're shaking a, a, a sergeant in the military. They, they have got it together. But even that is a cover for the quivering inside. The car you drive because of the image you want to project. A lot of people hide. And nowadays, online, I call it hiding in plain sight. Don't go online and judge yourself by what you see online. Almost no one posts their problems online. Now, some do. But most of the time, we show the cruise to the Caribbean, the concert we just attended. But what we don't post is that right now I feel so alone, even in a crowd. My children don't speak to me. I'm failing on my job. But look, I'm on the carnival victory. 
The third thing is that it produces distance from God. <clears throat> when, when, when this exposure was about to come, they hid from God. Now, the amazing thing about this is we, we look back on Scripture. We say, well, how can you hide from God? But that's what shame does. That, that, that's what, what, what happens when you uh, in that place. You say, you know, I'm going to run. And even though I know God can see everything, I still want to try and hide even from God. God really doesn't expect that. He just expects us to be honest. So the second thing of, uh, that we fear is disapproval. Disapproval makes me defensive. You ever, you ever thought of that? We move from hiding and hurting, from excusing to accusing. We start blaming, attacking, pointing fingers. But you did. And that's because the fear of disapproval. And, and when I feel like someone's going to reject me, then I strike first. I strike first. It's like the guy that comes home late, went out with the boys, went out to the bar, and he's there, you know, and he's kicking it back. And on the way home, he realized, oh, Lord, I'm going to have to deal with this lady when I get home. Because she want to know where I've been, why i just coming home, how come I, you know, didn't call. And so when he hits the door, she can hear him coming. He hit that door, and he's rocking the door, going up, bam, slam the door. Woman, you cook it? Right? What is he doing? He's making sure that she don't get the first word in, right? <laughs> he's all defensive, all defensive, because he knows that he's gonna be, his behavior is going to be disapproved. The more I fear disapproval, the more I point fingers at others. Look at Genesis 3.12. God asked, did you eat what I told you not to eat? Adam answered, you, <laughs> you gave me this woman. You. And this is a trait of mankind. Remember with Moses? Moses went to the Lord. Moses said, God, these are your people. Mo Mo Moses said, no, 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 God, you, these, these are your folks. Adam started. Adam went to God. Adam says, God, you gave me this woman, and she gave me the fruit. So Adam here is, is, is casting blame. He, he take, uh, no, it ain't me. I just happened to be bopping along, minding my own business, and this woman came and just forced this fruit down my throat, held me down, and made me eat it, told me if I don't eat it, she's going to hurt me, and so I ate it. Well, 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 Eve wasn't much better because Eve said, the snake tricked me. Whenever we're exposed, we begin to blame the other person. And so there's that fear, the fear of disapproval. But third, there's the fear of losing control. The fear of losing control. The more out of control you, fool, the more you feel, the more controlling you become. That's what a bully is all about. The bu bullies are really cowards on the inside. They want to control their environment. And so the more insecure you are, the greater your need to get your own way. So these are some fears. In your relationship, you can see yourself there, and you may be in a relationship with someone that's just trying to tell you what to do, control your life. Well, it's really they're insecure. Are you in relationships like this? Are you in relationships that there's a fear of losing control, a fear of disapproval? Is that a part of your life? Because you'll never have a good and wholesome relationship if you're afraid of your partner or your friends knowing about you. There will always be this distance that is created because of that fear. Learn to live in God's love is how we conquer this. Wherever God's love is, there is no fear because God's perfect love drives out all fear. To live in God's love, there are three things that we need to do, three daily choices that you need to make. You say, Pastor, how do I, how do I heal my relationships? Because let's be honest, we all have relationships that are in various stages of breakdown. You may not be angry with the person. You may not be in open conflict. But there's parts of that relationship that are not quite working. And it's hard because as humans, we're complicated. And I can't make you 
be better. I can only encourage you to be better. But we begin with a daily surrender of my heart to God. The closer I get to God, the more loving I'll be because God is love. In Job 11, we read these words, Surrender your heart to God. Turn to him in prayer and give up your sins, even those you do in secret. Then you won't be ashamed. You will be confident and fearless. Your troubles will go away like water beneath a bridge, and your darkest night will be brighter than noon. Then you will rest safe and secure, filled with hope and emptied of worry. There are three commands we have here. Number one, surrender your heart to God. Turn to him in prayer and give up your sins. If we're going to have relationships that are whole and healthy, we need to give ourselves over to God. See, as long as I hold on to, to this thing and say, this is me, I'm in control of my life, and, and, and I'll do it whatever I want, we have to surrender to God and say, God, you take control of my heart. Because that's where the essence of our relationship is. It's in our heart. If I have bitterness, if I have mistrust, if I have guilt, if I have shame in my heart, then I'm not confident, I'm not strong, I'm depressed, and I'm sad, and I'm worried. And in this, he says, if you do these things, I give you some promises. What are those promises? He says, you won't be ashamed. You'll be confident and fearless. And guess what? Your troubles will go away. Your darkest night will be brighter than noon. You'll rest safe secure, and you'll be filled with hope and emptied of worry. Isn't that where we want to be? We live on the edge a lot. Because if we strip everything else away, we are relational beings. And there's nothing worse than being out of relationship. Even the most introverted person needs relationship. If you're alone too long, it begins to wear you down. And so remember to surrender to God. But number two, remember the way God loves me. And this is the good part here. You see, because I'm completely accepted. I'm completely accepted. We spend a lot of our life trying to earn acceptance from our parents, from our peers, from those that we respect, even from those we envy. We want them to, to, to look at us and accept us. And we say, if I could only be perfect, then everyone will like me. That's a myth because Jesus wasn't liked by everybody. But there's this tape in our head that tells us, if I'm just perfect and, I, and if I can just make sure everybody sees me all put together, then they'll accept me. And when they don't accept me, it's a blow to my ego. It, it, it hurts when somebody doesn't accept me. And, and the bottom line is this, we all want to be accepted. You can tell me as much as you want, it don't matter. I don't care what people think. That's a lie. You do care what people think. You may not really care what everyone thinks, but you care what certain people think a whole lot. A whole lot. But guess what God says? God says, in him, you're completely accepted. Titus 3, 7, Jesus made us acceptable to God. Ephesians chapter 1 says we're accepted in the beloved. That means that God sees us for who we are, warts and all, and he accepts us. He doesn't reject us because of our issues and our problems. He says, I love you, and that leads me to two. I'm unconditionally loved. Now, humans, we, we place a lot of conditions. I will love you if. If you do this for me, I love you. If you do that for me, I love you. But unconditional love is that it is consistent and, and, and it doesn't depend on anything else. Isaiah 54, 10, my love for you will never end, says the Lord. God loves you unconditionally, and he accepts you completely. But you know, there's something else I'm totally forgiven. And this one, oh boy, 
Have you ever wrestled with feeling forgiven? I'm not talking about reading the scripture where it says you're forgiven and you say I'm forgiven because God says I'm forgiven. A judicial act where God says I forgave you. But do you, do you feel forgiven? Have you appropriated the forgiveness? Can you live with somebody believing that they've truly forgiven you? Because even when someone says I've forgiven you, depending on their track record, you still walk around on eggshells. I don't know if they really forgave me. And we betray ourselves sometimes because years later, we'll come up with a statement like, remember when? Now, that, that, that remember when is a problem. Because I was going along in my merry way thinking that we were together. We got it fixed. It's all under the bridge. Water, you know, under, we, we, we good. Until you politely whispered in my ear, remember when? We're totally forgiven, but there's no condemnation in Jesus. And sometimes I find that, that I, want, I want to condemn. You want to condemn. There are people around you that you want to condemn. You, if you had a hell to put them in, you'd put them there. They've hurt you. They've disappointed you. And if there was a hell that you could put them in, they'd be there before noon today. But you know what? God says there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. And he has taken the curse of condemnation from us. And so we can forgive. But I'm considered extremely valuable to God. <clears throat> A lot of us don't feel valuable. We don't feel like we're worth much. Psychologists call it low self-esteem, low self-worth. But so many of us have grown up feeling like an outcast, ostracized. We've been told we're no good. We don't feel we're as pretty as the other person. We feel we've got issues. You know, just uh, my shape ain't this, that, that I, I ain't got the whatever the deal is. And many of us came out of high school damaged. And take that damage right into adulthood because it's, it's now ingrained inside of us. How much do you think you're worth? Let me ask you another question. What makes something valuable? You ever thought of that? Why is it that I can sell something and get one price, but a celebrity can sell the same thing and get a different price. It's because of who owns it. They don't know me from Adam. So it means nothing, but depending on who that person is, we'll buy junk off a celebrity and pay millions of dollars for it, when someone else in Hoboken, Georgia, could have created the same thing but couldn't sell it to save their life. What made the difference? It was who owned the thing. Well, guess what? In 1 Corinthians 7, 23, it says this. You have been bought with a price and paid for by the death of Jesus and God says, now you belong to me. We're valuable. We're worth what? Why are we worth? We're worth it because we belong to God. I don't care what anybody says. I don't care what I look like, what I have, what I own. I am worthy because of who owns me. And God owns me. I am his child. He loves me with an everlasting love. I know we struggle. We struggle in our relationship because we feel that we're not worth it. We put up with things that we shouldn't put up with. Why? Because I think that's all I deserve. We've heard it. We've heard it. In abusive relationships, often an abuser will say to the other one, nobody wants you. If it wasn't for me, you'd have nobody. You better be glad I, I, I'm looking after you because you ain't, you ain't worth nothing. 
once that gets into our psyche, we believe that that's who we are, then we live like that. But you're worthy, why? Because you belong to God. And If you came in here this morning feeling, woe is me, I'm a worm, I need you to, to get up off the ground and say, I am who I am because of who he is. I am yours. And when that happens, we need to offer to others the same love that God has given to us. You want to have a relationship that works? Love people the way God loves you. Love people the way God loves you. John 13, 34, I'm giving you a new commandment. Love each other in the same way that I have loved you. Boy, <laughs> this is a decision. That, that, that verse... That verse is a decision verse. Because when you read it now, God says, I'm giving you a new commandment. Here's what I want you to do, saints. Love each other the same way that I have loved you. Now, you've got a choice. Didn't I say these were, these were some choices? And some will, will make a choice to do what God says, and others will make a choice to hold on to the bitterness, to hold on to the mistrust, to hold on to the anger, to hold on to whatever it is you're holding on. You say, you know what? There's some people just not worthy of my love. Don't get all sanctimonious for me this morning. Because we live, we live on this level. We live here. There are people that cross our paths in life, and they do sometimes. It's not even that hard. It's just like, you know what? Man, I, I, I don't want to be bothered with you. And we, and we withdraw our love. We withdraw it. But God says, I'm giving you a new commandment. Love each other in the same way that I have loved you. Church, I want you to know that this is a hard decision. But God calls us to do a lot of stuff. But then he gives us the strength. Romans 15, 7, accept one another just as Christ has accepted you. So I close with chapter with 1 Corinthians 13, 7. And here's what it says. Love never stops being patient. Love never stops being patient. Love never stops believing. Love never stops hoping. Love never gives up. If you want to be in a relationship, and, and I want you to, I want, let, me, let me go down the side and then we'll be done. Just a second here. I am not talking about abusive relationships that endanger your life. I want you to hear me clearly. So, so we set that aside. If it's unsafe, you need to get out to safety. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about you going, oh, I'm just, I'm just going to love him into a better person. You can love him into a better person from a distance. You don't, need, you don't need to be in that situation. So, And I think you know me well enough to know that's not what I'm talking about. But what I am saying is that we have to take our cue from Jesus. We ought to love like he loved, being patient, believing, hoping, never giving up but from a place of our own health and wholeness. Because loving somebody doesn't mean putting up with their craziness. It just means that I'm stepping out of the matrix. And I'm going to love you in spite of your faults, in spite of your issues. But I'm going to do it from a place of strength and a place of my own personal wholeness. Facing the fears that ruin relationships. Sometimes in church, issues that we face are not because of the issues themselves, but they're because of our inability to get along. We just can't get along. And sometimes it's because of our own vulnerabilities, our own fear of exposure, 
our own fears of disapproval. So we push other people away. So my prayer today is that we would begin to heal ourselves and to become a body that is functional and a body that is healthy, a body that is whole. Let's pray. Father, we thank you today. Adam and Eve, the very first people, knew how to blame. They knew how to deflect. They knew how to hide. But God, you revealed even from their lives that there is hope for change, and God's word takes us to a place where we can heal some of these hurts and be able to love each other the way we ought to. And so I pray now that you would just help us as we go forth to think deeply about our own lives, where we are, and how we can be better friends, better family members, better Christians. If there be one today that needs Jesus, Father, we pray that your spirit would work on them. Call them to yourself, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand with me? Father, again, take us from this place into the world that you've called us to witness of your power and your strength, but also of your love and your compassion. Father, thank you for the testimony of your word that leads us to a place of greater wholeness. Walk with us, Father, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>